whenever you're ready, Prabhu. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you to our webinar on reimagining regulatory responses to trafficking, reflections on the South Asian experience. So this webinar is being co-hosted by the Global Alliance Against Traffic uh, in Women, which is an international network of NGOs and CBOs with its secretariat in Bangkok, Thailand, as well as by the Laws of Social Reproduction Project, which is an EU supported project and is based at King's College London and at IWAGE in New Delhi. So the immediate provocation for our meeting today is the imminent introduction and passage of the Trafficking in Persons Protection Care and Rehabilitation Bill of uh, 2021 in the Indian Parliament next week. But our ultimate goal is to reimagine what a humane anti-trafficking law might actually look like from the perspective of the Global South and in particular, the South Asian region, and to ask if this is even conceivable or feasible. Now, the search for this kind of model, I think, is universal. Um, so not long ago, Lou DeBaca, who is the head of the US State Department's office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons during the Obama administration, admitted that the US's attempt in 2000 to bring its 13th Amendment jurisprudence to bear on the prostitution and sexual slavery of women and girls through the protocol misfired. And he claimed that sex trafficking had eaten up the entire field of trafficking um, and had chipped away at the three Ps that the protocol sought to promote, namely prevention, protection, and prosecution by unduly focusing on prosecution, leaving us with a security paradigm. And he called for a balance whereby law enforcement could prevent trafficking while minimizing the collateral damage to already marginalized communities. So the goal of our session today is to ask how this balance uh, can be struck, if it can be struck, and how it has been attempted in the South Asian context. So in the jurisdiction that I know best in the South Asian region, namely India, this has been impossible to achieve. Uh, the government has consistently embraced a policy of sex work exceptionalism, where it has conflated trafficking with trafficking for sex work and trafficking with sex work itself. And of course, we suspected that this might have been because this is the easier route given the vast problem of forced labor, bonded labor, and high levels of precarity in the informal sector affecting millions of men, women, and children who are always just a, a little bit shy of dropping below the poverty line. Um, yet India's attempt to amend uh, its law you know, in 2005 in the wake of the adoption of the Palermo Protocol by simply amending the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1986 to criminalize customers of sex workers uh, was dangerous, no doubt, but legally speaking, it was a rather minimalist move compared to what we are seeing today, which is a sweeping legislative proposal in the form of the Trafficking Bill of 2021. So I'll just say a few words about the bill uh, to introduce those of you who may not have had a chance to, to read the bill. Uh, so the bill is a 38 page law uh, it has 11 chapters and it has 59 sections. Uh, there is a brief chapter two with literally two sections that makes the National Investigation Agency, the National Investigative and Coordinating Agency for Preventing and Combating Trafficking. Then there is chapter, chapter three, which sets up anti-human trafficking committees at the central, state and district levels. Chapter four deals with preventive measures. Chapter five uh, is quite elaborate and it deals with search, rescue and emergence, a new term we find in this bill, as well as post-emergence and rehabilitation of victims of trafficking. Chapter six deals with repatriation and reintegration of victims and chapter seven deals with compensation. Chapters eight and nine deal with offenses and penalties amounting to almost 13 pages. So we find that chapters nine, uh, chapters 10 and 11 then deal with miscellaneous provisions and amendments of related laws. Um, and quite significantly, section 59 deletes the current anti-trafficking provisions in the Indian Penal Code, namely sections 370 and 370A. Now, we have several experts here today who will unpack the bill for, it, for us and its impact, but I'll simply just by way of an overarching comment, just mentioned that it is a highly punitive law and it spares no one. It does not spare workers, families of workers, landlords, consumers, employers, the media, corporations, workers advocates, and the public at large. It is heavily reliant on raids, rescue, and rehabilitation. 
So victims will be put away in homes for indefinite periods of time with a high threshold for self-release. So there is little trust in the agency of the survivor. Uh, surveillance is weaved into the law of pre-trafficking, post-rescue, and long after rehabilitation. There is little accountability from the government or from home operators. And there are several offenses with high levels of imprisonment, including for the remainder of one's life. And we also find the introduction of the death penalty. And fines can be very steep. It can go up to a crore for certain offenses. Um, and it definitely seems to want to abolish sex work, as well as the making, distribution, and consumption of pornography. So as the economic freefall post-pandemic intensifies and levels of indebtedness soar for workers, um, it seems that we've become a country of bonded laborers and quote-unquote victims of trafficking, uh, with workers getting ready for a different kind of stay at home, in this instance, um, you know, staying at a government home. Um, so to really help us unpack the bill, but also place it against the backdrop of regional and international experience, um, I'm really delighted to introduce you to several expert speakers today. Um, so in the first panel, we have Gautam Modi, who's the General Secretary of the New Trade Union Initiative. We have Bandana Patnayak, who is the International Coordinator of the Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women. We have Igor Bosk, who is Chief Technical Advisor of the Work and Freedom Program at the ILO. Uh, we have Binita Pandey, who is a lawyer with the Women's Rehabilitation Center in Nepal. And then we have Tripti uh, Tandon, who is at the Lawyers Collective in India. And in the second panel, we have Ziba Sikora, who's an associate at Project 39A. We have Saraswesta Thomas, who's a professor at the National Law School of India University, Bangalore. We have Aisha Rai, who's the coordinator of the National Network of Sex Workers. We have Rachna Mudraboina, who is founder of Transvision. Uh, we have uh, Bhagya Lakshmi, who is secretary of Ashodaya Samiti and a board member of the All India Network of Sex Workers. And finally, we have Bharti De who's mentor of the Durbar Mahila Samanvaya Committee and board member of the All India Network of Sex Workers. So interventions from all our panelists will be short uh, so that we have time for Q&A. And uh, we are hoping to only track the Q&A box for any questions that you might have. So if you have questions posted in the Q&A uh, part of Zoom, uh, if you have other comments, you can place it in the chat function. So we will be recording this session, so please do not record it on your own. And uh, we will definitely make the recording available soon after the session, given that it's on a weekend and uh, many interested participants couldn't join today. So thank you. And I now invite uh, Gautam to, to share his thoughts with us. I'm, I'm no expert in this gathering. I have to begin by, by paying tribute to the martyrdom of Sam Swami. All our friends, comrades, colleagues, and just about every other person who's been jailed by the regime that seeks to move this traffic in the world. I'd also at this meeting, most of all, like to remember Dr. Jana, who most significantly is responsible for raising the question of access to health care for discriminated, most of all, sex workers. Uh, Gautam, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we're not able to hear you very clearly. Can you hear me better now? Much better. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I have some some problem getting used to. I think Dr. Jana really is the one amongst us who gave sex workers for identity and dignity the led to the front. And we lost him like we've lost a great many to COVID. And perhaps that's you know the starting point. What we're going to see in India as India returns to normal, whenever that may be, a reworking of the arrangement between employers and employees, especially at the very bottom. We're going to see 
if we're not already witnessing new forms of labor contracts. And I importantly want to flag labor contracts going back to 19th century terms, rolling in transport, end-to-end -end contracts, new forms of indenture and bondage, led by this BJP government that's effectively dismantling the Indian Railway. You know, the one thing that's virtually been shut through these 15 months is the Railway. If one looks at the number of lower end seats available, so what is called the second class sleeper seats available, they're about, about, about one fifth of what was before the pandemic. So the freedom to sell labor power, get on train, go to town, sell labor power, is actually been rapidly lost. And I think in that context forced labor. So now there are buses from villages in Bihar, villages in West Bengal, villages in, 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 in the Indian Northeast, nonstop to take them to work sites. In Tamil Nadu, in Karnataka, in Kerala, in Maharashtra, in the rapid, in the fast growing states, in the states that take migrants in. We're only seeing the tip of this iceberg or the start of this, 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 this epistemological movement. Much of it is hearsay, but this is really where we are. We're at a point where, you know, I. I share the discomfort of the bill, but I'm not sure I, you know, I I'm not sure we, we, we understand it from the same place. Recently, when I looked at the bill late last night, it's taken to look like it's a combination of two objectives. India needs to move to the next level of body shopping, to make its bodies physically available. Until now, we were low end data gatherer, low end data, 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 data entry. I hope people can hear me better now. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a uh, an audio problem I'm using a set of headphones which are not very reliable, but my computer is no longer reliable. It needs to change quite quickly. I'm really sorry about that. We are, we're, we're moving to actually seek profit directly from our, our bodies, and the pandemic opens a new opportunity for more medical testing. For, 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 for direct exploiting of the human body. So in a way, we need to rush this bill to, to check off the globe, boxes of global, of global compliance. Does India have a legislation that deals with, deals with trafficking? And then we have an intrinsically carceral regime that brings in, brings in punitive law or brings in penal law for everything. And so they've just slapped in that part of it. That's what comes naturally, naturally. So it's really the combination of the two that we absolutely have to get this law because we have global, we have transnationals, pharma transnationals queuing up to, do, 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 uh, to test. This is not the last of the vaccines we've seen in the phase, this is only the first. Now, I, I find curiously that really it's only in the explanatory section of section 23 of this bill that we find reference to forced labor and the global supply chain. And yes, while it holds everybody responsible, and I agree with that, it actually does not hold corporations criminally responsible. So it's really reducing it to level, uh, to individual criminal law, and allowing, if I can go back to Bhopal, really unlearning what we learned from Bhopal or the Bhopal gas tragedy, that corporates will continue to get away. So the chap down the line will, you know, will probably lose his job, will face fines, will we'll maybe go to jail if something goes wrong, badly wrong and comes about the sectors. But corporations, which is very important, will continue to get away. And that's in a way the problem with being you know, expanding it and, and, and really, I mean, of course it is, you know, I heard India's only living Nobel laureate, of course, wants this law here and now. Uh, 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 the, the, the haste for the law uh, and the way it's targeting women and children in particular 
is what 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 Prabha just said. It is in the introduction. But leaving the larger liability, which would come through labor rights at a time when our labor rights have actually been virtually written down, leaves us with nowhere. Forced labor includes forced labor, forced overtime. It's not just about indenture and bond. Uh, we have huge amounts we know of forced labor, of forced overtime. We've seen desperate attempts by this government to, 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 to weaken the law of overtime and in some cases fail. Of course, these may be only temporary failures for, 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 for the viciousness of this regime. Uh, so, 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 I think a campaign against this law or this bill needs to look at a wide range of questions of the connected nature of the supply chain, the motive force of the supply chain being the transnational corporation and really defining in a very large sense uh, 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 how, 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 how capitalism works, but also the transformation that we face uh, in terms of the world post the pandemic or living with forms of the pandemic, both in terms of what it's going to do to the labor force and the work and, and labor processes, but what it's also going to do with the kind of income earning. It's not just about job opportunities, but the income of earning opportunities that are going to be thrown up in the global south. And, you know, perhaps there's nothing more ironic than the sheer hubris with which Narendra Modi sold India as the pharmacy to the world uh, at the start of this year. The fact that what he's actually now, what the world is now beginning to look at is, yes, these are pretty good contract manufacturers. And this would be one of the largest contract testing sites on this planet, paid for paid small amounts at very low cost at very low liabilities um, to move to move um, you know a patent rich trans a transnational control global economy forward. Uh, I'm going to stop there uh, and I'm not sure how the QA will work but uh, I will as I said if, uh, leave, leave the program at one o'clock because I have another unfortunate which I'm sorry to yeah, I think maybe because given that Gautam is uh, will will have to leave sooner, maybe we can just take a quick round of questions for him before we continue with the program. Would that be all right? Uh, does anyone have any uh, questions? I mean, you gave us so much to think about, Gautam. Um, if there are any uh, clarifications or or comments, um, we can we can give you a chance to speak. Okay, well, I think uh, while everyone uh, you know, collects their thoughts, we can probably move on to Bandana. And then if there are questions for Gautam, uh, we, he can take them right after Bandana's intervention. Thank you, Gautam. Okay, thank you, Prabha. It's a pleasure to be um, with all of you this morning. And, uh, I have a very short uh, PowerPoint, which I will try to share just I did that just to keep myself focused. It's been a very, okay, let me see. All right. Okay. Can people see it now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is just a very a short, um, um, PowerPoint, and um, I would like us to start with looking at this picture, which was taken by Danish Siddiqui uh, last year, uh, just to remember him, uh, because he was killed on Friday uh, while covering the uh, sort of clashes between Afghanistan forces and the Taliban. But he was one of the few um, 
journalists of India who had uh, covered the migrant workers' desperate situation last year. There were, you know, while our mainstream media has absolutely kind of, you know, reached its lowest of the low standards, uh, there were few very brave journalists and Danish was one of them. And so this is one of his many pictures. And the other reason I wanted to start with this is also to hold that in our memory, to remember the situation, the difficult situation that migrant workers uh, in India, the internal migrant workers uh, situation that they faced last year and what this draft bill, if it comes into force, might do to them. So basically, you know, I would just have very quickly, I would like to talk a little bit about what we do and uh, then look at the, these two sort of interlinked, uh, the human trafficking and labor migration in South Asia and how states have looked at it and how CSOs have looked at it. And then the gaps that I see and the few silver linings that I see. And then my, only my last slide is on the draft bill. There are many, uh, and like Gautam said, I'm no expert either. Uh, so uh, I'm just one of the many people who are, I think that there are many more qualified legal professionals uh, in the panel who will talk about uh, you know, the bill in detail. So talking about GetW, we are a bit of a peculiar, we are a peculiar organization actually. Uh, we started uh, in 1994, and I remember when I started working uh, here in 99, there were not too many things to read about, but two things that I was told, one and a couple of texts that, or a couple of documents that we had, one was uh, actually I had to do the proofreading and bring it into a sort of little publication uh, stage, was the Migrating Women's Handbook. So there was a handbook in 2000 that we brought out, which is called the Migrating Women's Handbook. And I remember asking my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, why is GATW, which is working on trafficking, doing something on uh, the migrant, Migrating Women's Handbook? And I was told that, oh, but we are a pro-women's mobility or women's right to mobility organization. And anti-trafficking can easily become anti uh, mobility, right to mobility. So, and the second document that I was uh, asked to read as one of my early readings was a kind of consultation um, uh, sort of uh, report, uh, which was called Moving the Horde Stigma, and which was trying to understand, you know, the uh, rights of sex workers and why sex workers are organizing and what are their goals, etc. So that's where we are located. You know, anti-trafficking is very much in our title, but we do look at migration and labor. And one group of workers that we have worked very closely are sex workers, but over the years we have worked with many other workers. That said, uh, we haven't, as a, uh, particularly as a secretariat, we haven't worked with men or with male workers, and we haven't also focused much uh, on children. Uh, so many of our members, of course, work with men as well as with children. So the secretariat hasn't done. So that's the limitation. Um, I would so I would be speaking from that sort of you know like a little bit of and because we have members all over the world and also in South Asia, I'll be speaking from that perspective, but with very obvious limitations. So looking at the you know human trafficking, labor migration, and the South Asian states. Human trafficking in across South Asia exclusively focused on the sex sector, primarily tried to police the movement of women within South Asia. And uh, uh, India was seen very much within South Asia as a destination state. And I remember 20, uh, you know, two decades ago. Uh, it was Nepal, which was like the poster child of anti-trafficking or trafficking in South Asia. And even within Nepal, a few districts, like Sindhupal Chowk was a name that came up again and again. So it was the movement of women from Sindhupal Chowk to Calcutta, to Bombay, is what was being talked about as trafficking. Uh, SAR Convention, 
uh, the, I mean, we all know um, the sorry state of uh, regional cooperation or lack of regional cooperation in South Asia. And SAR Convention was actually one of the first regional instruments within Asia and horrible. Uh, so in 1997, it was uh, initiated, it was, uh, people talked about it. And then there was quietness for a bit. But what I remember very clearly in 99 was, and this is what I would like to think the absence of what I see now is there was a lot of civil society mobilization around it. It's a different story that we failed, but there was very, very rich conversation and very strong resistance to what was there in the convention. We didn't succeed in changing the convention. And uh, but so in 2002, we had this instrument which nobody uses and um, which is very, very backward looking. And then, so, but labor migration and human trafficking have sort of remained largely independent of each other in terms of policy. And uh, the, um, uh, and particularly like uh, two, if we take two states uh, as an example, and every state within South Asia have a different kind of history and different kind of context within which they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, worked with, um, on their labor migration policies or human trafficking policies. But if you take two states uh, as example, like Bangladesh and Nepal, for example, who proactively uh, sort of started uh, developing uh, or started looking at labor migration as a development strategy and created policies, etc. Very clearly, the states said, please don't mix up with migration, uh, trafficking. Please don't contaminate with uh, this, with trafficking, because they didn't really want their sort of, you know, labor migration agenda to be negatively impacted by uh, human trafficking, sort of the, the criminalization thing. It's a different matter that they themselves have actually, you know, when there are issues, when there is, uh, um, say, uh, exploitation recorded, they have actually responded by uh, uh, creating, so, uh, you know, stopping women or creating barriers to women's movement or women's migration. But then this was a very clear uh, sort of position of the state. Don't mix up both. And uh, then, so looking at, you know, how CSOs have responded uh, is, is thing. what I see over the years is from very strong political engagement and conceptual questioning, we have now reached a level and I am very much within the CSO community. So it's not a comment that I'm making from any sort of, you know, like a, a different space. It is also a critique of our own work. So. So from a very strong political engagement, we have come to a kind of project management approach. So we manage our projects. We try to keep everything within a particular this thing. You know, so while you know, there has been a lot of uh, so-called quote and unquote professionalism in our work, it's mostly, okay, you, know, you set your indicators and you try to do this thing, but you don't question the main frame. You don't question uh, what might be the basis or what might be the rationale. And what has also happened over the last two decades is very strong lines of division among CSOs. And uh, very clearly we are working within silos. So migrant rights and anti-trafficking and you know, whatever different, different uh, bodies this thing. And we don't have the time or the opportunity to talk to each other and to see how our work might be contradicting each other. And um, so, and the problematic role of donors, I'm not going into uh, it uh, too much here, but the, prob the very problematic role that is thing now, donors actually define the politics. They come with their particular baggage, particular understanding, conceptual understanding, and there is no room within that to question that conceptual understanding. And uh, so, but what has also happened in the last, particularly in the last decade or so, there's a kind of strange convergence between anti-trafficking work and migrant rights work, particularly in the area of assistance, if you like, or if you want to use a better word, like rights protection. So the rights protection uh, mechanism, like there are shelters, there are shelters for abused migrants, there are shelters from, for anti I mean, for trafficked victims, and uh, the assistance mechanism, and of course, this whole thing called the reintegration support. 
So very clearly, the labor migration issues, it is kind of because it is kind of premised on precarity. Precarity is built into that. There is nothing in that which actually allows you to do much better. So, so within that, obviously, there are many complaints, there are many issues that the migrant workers face. And then there are these, you know, we in the CSO community are supposed to be providing assistance because the state does not take that kind of a proactive role. And so the, what I see as silver linings in this difficult situation is, of course, what I see is much stronger sectoral organizing compared to what it was. So over the years, definitely sex workers organizing globally, not just in South Asia, but globally has gotten stronger. And domestic workers, thanks to the ILO convention, there's a huge amount of mobilization that has gotten str uh, stronger. The garment sector, which is actually a traditional space where they were a formal sector organizing and they're facing different kinds of issues. But within that, again, we see strong organizing or getting stronger. Construction sector and role of organizations such as you know IDWF, WeGo, SEVA, and many other national trade unions who have tried to come in. Of course, you know they can. It can get much better. But what I see is that this is where I see some hope and uh, positive thing. There are particularly in the last eighteen months this very rich discussion among feminists and um, other activists you know, first thing, building back uh, better feminist wants, uh, system change. These are not mere slogans. There is a lot of discussion and churning that is happening. I don't see that kind of positive thing from coming from the states, but I see the, you know, civil society, there's much more openness and desire actually to communicate and discuss things with each other. And some of our own fledgling collaborative efforts, like you know, Women Workers for Change and Women Workers Forum that KW has been engaging, has sort of you know created a little bit of a thing. Coming my last slide. So coming to the bill, uh, now you know I think people will talk about the many weaknesses that it has, such as the high penalties, the institutionalized assistance, and the and the fact that it will continue to harass sex workers. Uh, this is, to my mind, is primarily a crime control instrument that borrows the ambiguities of the UN protocol. One example is this you know, wonderful phrase, abuse of the position of vulnerabilities. Now, you, uh, UN ODC struggled with it, many other people struggled with it, and now you have lots of things you know, written about it, and we know the history, how this peculiar phrase came into this thing. But then Indian government has chosen to put that in their draft, maybe to just to sound sort of, you know, um, up to date and things like that. So, and it completely ignores the OHHR guidelines. And uh, coming to how it might impact on uh, migrant workers, like I think Prabha was saying in her um, uh, uh, opening remarks, this probably will create a whole country full of trafficking victims and, um, and uh, you know, forced labor uh, victims. So it creates confusion within India's recent uh, sort of labor court, particularly the one on occupational, the OSH and the social security. And it also has, it's very inconsistent with the bonded labor uh, abolition act. And so basically it will potentially, it turns all interstate migrant workers into traffic persons. And then of course, you know, they would be in the homes uh, and uh, so that's that's the scenario that it would look like. Reminds me of uh, our colleagues, uh, the migrant workers colleagues from Indonesia, who used to say, "Our state is our trafficker. Our state is our trafficker because our state does not understand our uh, situation." And so it's basically you think. So maybe we need to go back to the old forced labor convention and see that if the state is a perpetrator of forced labor, what needs to be done. So it is a terrible situation. It is very bad timing, very ill-timed. And I suspect it is just done to tick boxes, nothing more. But then while, tick, while they tick their boxes, the damages and the damage control, this thing now a whole lot of people will spend time trying to uh, kind of deal with it and those things. So it's not a very good situation.
Thank you. I'll stop here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bandana. That was really, really, really terrific, uh, both in terms of diagnosing the current state of affairs, especially within civil society, but also you know, how you're seeing this playing out in the South Asian context. It's really quite valuable. Um, so um, I, I know that Gautam has to leave soon, so I just wanted to quickly sneak in a question or two for him before he had to leave. Um, are there any questions from, from anyone? I think Gautam, if I could just ask you very quickly, if you could please clarify your point about the railways. That sounded very interesting, but we couldn't fully hear everything you were saying. Uh, maybe if you could just uh, expand on it a little bit, that would be great. You know, something that's gone, um, can you hear me well now? Okay. Something that's gone completely noticed is unnoticed is that when the lockdown was lifted in the summer of 2020, the railways came back into functioning very slowly. And when they first did, the only trains that came back in were trains that had 100% uh, air conditioned and upper class seats. Uh, they slowly introduced the more regular trains, but even in by the March of 2021, if one looks at one of the most traveled routes in the country and very critical in terms of um, um, the geography, in terms of migrant workers, uh, uh, the, the, the Howrah Delhi route had only 21% of its pre pandemic second class sleeper seats back on the rails day on day. Uh, uh, but the fact is, by the Mar by March of 2021, we had significant return of migrant workers to both metros and to um, large construction and industrial centers uh, uh, in the in the high growth states. So, 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 where were they coming from? And that's when we found uh, we saw them actually at the at the other end. We saw them at the receiving end, where there were these buses originating. Uh, in villages of Eastern India, which then were to specific points. So we, you know, uh, uh, let's put it this way. It's not as if this kind of labor broking does not exist or did not exist pre-pandemic. Uh, but there was a freedom, so to speak, for, 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 for the free soul to, you know, get on a train, go to Madras or go to Delhi or whatever, or go through a family network rather than a broker, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now that freedom, so to speak, to sell your labor power is gone. You're going to now have to, if you want to get out of your village, you're going to have to actually, the, the, the market for that is going to get limited if there's going to be a restriction on transport. And, 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 and that would really then not make, uh, yes, under the shadow of the state, but not to take what she said forward, make, petty capital, the crucial source of migrant li linked into the supply chain, of course, of global capital. So we're looking at new forms of, of um, uh, you know, we're looking at new transport, new arrangements, which would, 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 would create new labor tying arrangements, new forms of bondage, so on and so forth. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. That is really, really quite uh, thought provoking. Um, are there any other questions for Gautam? at this point? Okay, uh, I think then we will uh, move on to Igor, uh, who will be speaking next. Igor, as you know, is at the ILO. Igor, over to you. Uh, thank you, Prabha, and uh, th um, thank you also, um, Gautam. I think it was, it was very inspiring to hear you. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I work in, uh, in the ILO in a program that is supposed to be tackling uh, uh, trafficking in persons. We're supposed to be reducing vulnerability to uh, forced labor. Um, that is a very difficult uh, uh, task, of course, because uh, um, it's, uh, it's easy to formulate such a statement, but uh, in practice, given the way uh, uh, policies are shaped, um, uh, it's, 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 it's almost, uh, 
uh, impossible task, but nevertheless, uh, we have tried to uh, uh, analyze the different policies that, um, uh, that shape the situations around which forced labor occur. Uh, my, uh, just, uh, just checking my video is off. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so we've been trying to address these types of issues. And so uh, it is in this, uh, uh, in this light that basically uh, we're looking at the traffic. Now, of course, we welcome the fact that the government is, has an intent of doing something about uh, uh, trafficking in persons. Uh, uh, and I think uh, that, that, that is, that's definitely worth uh, noting. Of course, the intent is one thing and what it actually does is a completely uh, different issue. Um, and therefore, uh, that's what we wanted to focus on. I think what it actually does is something which others will be speaking about and have uh, Prabha and Gautam and Bandana also have spoken about this. Uh, but um, uh, I will just say a little bit about uh, wh what is problematic in the bill uh, from ILO's uh, point of view. And we have actually signaled uh, uh, as ILO uh, some of our, of our uh, reservations uh, to the Ministry uh, of Labor, uh, uh, hoping that the Ministry of Labor will convey this to the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Um, so, uh, there's four areas, particularly. There is the impact of the bill on the world of work, uh, which is uh, quite significant uh, in many ways, uh, and I'll elaborate a little bit on that. Um, th then the second point is how the bill is almost the opposite of, of the uh, sort of a, what the protocol on forced labor of the ILO promotes, which is more about prevention rather than criminalization and, and how to, to be effective in tackling labor abuses, a preventive approach is really very important and central and it's, it's, it's practically absent from, from the bill. Uh, the third point basically uh, uh, is about how the bill really overemphasizes the, the criminal offenses. The, the, it's a penal nature. I think uh, Prabha and others have also mentioned this, uh, but in ways which uh, which, uh, which go way beyond what the previous bill uh, three years ago uh, had proposed. Um, and um, uh, then um, not, and, and the previous bill was already problematic uh, from that perspective. Um, and, and finally, we'll say a couple of words about uh, the, uh, the whole focus on uh, rehabilitation homes and, and how this is basically uh, restricting significantly the agency of uh, uh, migrant workers, particularly, uh, and, and marginalized groups uh, in a context where, where they need the exact uh, opposite. They need actually uh, more agency. They need more mobility and so therefore it's, it, the bill is, is, is problematic from that respect. So in those four, under those four angles, um, just a few uh, issues. I'm not going to go in through uh, sort of a, a, a quote, you know, a point by point uh, 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 demonstration of what is problematic. I'll just summarize some of these issues. Um, the 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 bill uh, covers uh, basically areas of employment, which are essentially the mandate of the Ministry of Labor and Employment, and any change in labor laws normally requires adequate discussions and consultations, um, you know, social dialogue with workers, employer representatives in line with ILO convention number 144 uh, on tripartite consultations, um, which has been ratified actually by India. Um, the, uh, so also, um, uh, while it is understandable that forced labor uh, is, is treated as a, as a criminal offense. The bill in its current form has a potential to encompass other common labor abuses, such as faulty recruitment, poor working conditions, non-payment of wages, and other exploited working conditions under the domain of criminal law. Uh, now, we don't think that's very effective. Uh, such uh, labor relations of, of these types of natures are best addressed uh, under the ambit of applicable labor law, uh, even if it's in its uh, shortcomings, uh, and as well as the applicable um, bonded labor uh, system abolition act of 1976. Um, so, so um, those are some some points. Also, very important to to mention is that the uh, there, 
the um, uh, the bill is really silent uh, on the bonded labor uh, uh, abolition act. Um, it's not clear whether actually it's going to probably supersede the, the the bonded. I mean, others might be able to say more about that. Um, and uh, well, stakeholders have held that the rules and implementation of act need strengthening. The bonded um, uh, Labor Act is much more nuanced. It builds on a robust understanding of how the world of work operates, uh, especially in the informal economy, and prohibits a wide gamut of bonded labor practices in uh, in India. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, the Supreme Court of India has even expanded the definition of bonded labor beyond the ILO uh, Convention of Forced Labor, and has held that non um, payment of minimum wages along with indicators of abuse of vulnerability would amount to forced labor. Um, the definition uh, section leaves trafficking persons, uh, which is a central purpose of the bill, undefined and uh, sort of unclear. Um, uh, in chapter eight on penalties and offenses, it uses uh, the words of the Palermo Protocol's definition of anti-trafficking to establish penalties and offenses without actually referring it to as a definition. Uh, now, uh, um, it is widely recognized that you know, human trafficking requires more than penal measures. It, it would really be advisable that the human trafficking definition of the Palermo Protocol be in the definition of, uh, be in the definition chapter and, and not in the uh, penalties and offenses chapter. Um, I mean, I could say much more about definitions. Um, uh, just to elaborate a little more on definitions, for example, uh, the definition of sexual exploitation criminalizes anyone who is paid to assist a person involved in commercial sex and, 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 and hence benefits from such an assistance. Well, this of, of course can involve uh, human traffickers. It may also involve those who supply food victims uh, with food and water and shelter without an intent uh, other than to make ends meet for themselves. Uh, therefore, uh, the proposed definition can undermine the capacity of victims, potential victims and their peers to make a living. Uh, the UN special measures to, uh, for protection from sexual exploitation and sexual abuse have um, a definition of sexual uh, exploitation that avoids that. They define sexual exploitation as any actual or attempted abuse of a position of vulnerability, differential power, or trust for sexual purposes, including but not limited to profiting monetarily, socially, or politically from the sexual exploitation of another. Um, so many other things could be say about definitions. I'm sure others will say that. Um, uh, the last point on the first in the area of uh, the world of work and how the bill actually uh, sort of encroaches in the world of work uh, is that it, there's really, it's not clear how the bill aligns with, so not only with uh, uh, the bonded labor system, which, which I mentioned before, but with other legislation such as the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act, uh, the uh, Indian Penal Code, in many ways, the Child Labor Regulation Act, uh, uh, the Scheduled Caste and Tribes Act, and others. Um, so the second point, which uh, which is important to emphasize, is the whole prevention in nature, which is missing from uh, the bill. Um, so the uh, while there's a, a need to punish offenders who engage in trafficking and forced labor through penal measures, it is also important to recognize that labor and employment law provide for labor dispute resolution mechanisms, addressing for addressing of individual worker grievances, social dialogue, and collective bargaining, all of which have proven useful in preventing forced labor. Um, any mechanism to address forced labor um, should also address its root causes and focus on prevention rather than merely addressing the symptoms of forced labor. And Article 1 of Protocol 29 of the ILO, which supplements the ILO Forced Labor Convention Number 29, defines its key purpose to give effect to member state obligations under Convention 29 to suppress forced labor while taking effective measures to prevent and eliminate its use to provide to victims protection and access to appropriate and effective remedies such as compensation and to sanctions uh, and to sanction the perpetrators of forced labor. Um, uh, the forced labor um, supplementary convention of 2014 uh, um, enjoins each member state to adopt preventive measures while taking into account its national circumstances. Um, uh, the 
uh, apart from prevention, the need for progressive increments in improving labor and employment conditions is critical in large economies such as India, where informal employment and the informal sector play a preponderant role. Merely relying on the rescue of workers who are victims from a workplace and then trying to rehabilitate these workers in other workplaces when the jobs are already scarce will be a challenge to say the least. Instead, employment policies, working conditions, and wages need to be improved. Uh, workers need to be organized and unionized and their capacities uh, built to engage in social dialogue. Such a prevention approach requires a better administration implementation of labor laws and not uh, criminalizing uh, suboptimal conditions of work. Um, the, and now a, a couple of words about the, how the bill really uh, uh, overemphasizes criminal offenses. Uh, uh, particularly chapters eight and nine. Uh, uh, the, the recruitment of workers across and within states um, in India into sectors where working conditions are not optimal is pretty widespread, as you would all uh, know. Under the bill, particularly sections 29, 25, 29, 30, and 31, significant numbers of economic actors, both in the formal and unorganized economy may be exposed to unbearable charges of abetment, conspiracy, and attempt to commit a trafficking offense, taking benefit out of the exploitation of a victim or unlawful handling of identity leading to severe penalties or imprisonment. Um, uh, the bill refers to uh, massage parlors, spas, employment agencies, placement agencies, providing domestic work, immigration agencies or agents, travel agencies or agents, uh, notankis, not circus, melas, and other similar activities. Uh, um, uh, and Prav also mentioned landlords, which is, which is true is there as well. Uh, uh, many of these sectors play an important role in the economy and uh, employment, uh, employ migrant workers in large numbers. Uh, the criminal approach of the bill, leaving no room for social dialogue, may undermine employment and migration. This may actually be a violation of Article 19 uh, um, of the Constitution of India, under which a citizen has the right to practice any profession or to carry out any occupation, trade, or business. Um, uh, then there's incongruencies, such as uh, you know, the bill includes provisions of making uh, work leading to disease as tuberculosis and silicosis an aggravated form of trafficking. And yet we know that uh, tuberculosis is widely found in workers with poor health. Uh, the bill applies aggravated penalties uh, to abusive uh, labor involving child victims, for instance, recruiters and employers of child domestic workers would face uh, more severe penalties under aggravated trafficking, yet it is common knowledge that the practice is widely spread. Um, now, of course, the main question is, is really, is a criminal approach uh, the right way and the most effective way to address this? Um, we don't think so. Um, the uh, blanket criminalization of a significant number of employers, labor recruiters, and workers seems ill-conceived, uh, seems uh, like an inclusive response to a broader endemic problem associated with economic and social development in the country that traps the labor market in suboptimal working conditions and which therefore demands a combination of economic and social development policies and measures to strengthen labor administration and labor legislation, including regulation of recruitment agencies and labor inspection, as well as promoting fair, competitive, and sustainable business and enterprises instead of only imposing criminal penalties. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there for the, uh, uh, for the emphasis on the criminal approach and, and get to the last point, which is mostly on the rehabilitation homes and the rescue and raid uh, uh, focus of the bill. Uh, the bill seems to promote um, rescue and raids. I experience has demonstrated that rescue raids models tend to be less effective uh, than other measures uh, because they often fall, fail to address the root causes that are creating conditions of uh, trafficking and forced labor and do not respond to the reasons why migrants, um, workers migrate um, and their need for agency. In the context of uh, workers, such rescues also take away the livelihood instead of improving wages and working conditions. Uh, the, the rescued workers often take more unsafe journeys and precarious work arrangements as they struggle to meet their basic needs. Uh, measures that focus on prevention 
and reducing vulnerabilities to force sale in line with ILO protocol of 2014 um, should be considered instead. Um, while uh, victims are given the option to demand uh, to exit a rehabilitation home, the procedures require presentation of an affidavit, which would be difficult to do so for most victims living in poverty. And the magistrate may still uh, overrule the victim's desire if um, he thinks that the victim is, is being compelled. In this sense, the bill promotes compulsory institutionalization of victims and even potential victims in the name of rehabilitation rather than an approach that protects uh, and promotes victims' rights, ensures their agency through requirements uh, for ongoing informed consent and empowering them through social integration programs. Uh, use and the role of district trafficking committees should uh, be monitored and addressed with caution as experience on the ground has shown that the institutional mechanisms to quote unquote protect women can sometimes become anti-migration institutions that create barriers to feed migration as uh, Bandana has uh, just uh, mentioned. Also, the bill uh, appears to conflict sex work with trafficking for sex. This is a moralistic approach to sex work rather than one that places the workers and rights of workers at the heart of policy responses. This approach of criminalization may drive the industry further underground, expose them to greater occupational health and safety risks such as HIV AIDS, uh, and could make sex workers even more vulnerable to forced labor and violence at work. The approach will increase stigma against consensual sex workers and sanction state-based discrimination. Um, uh, I'll leave it um, uh, there. I just I would just like to conclude by saying that the bill is really not a comprehensive section. Uh, not not it really. Uh, it needs to be revised uh, thoroughly um, uh, in order um, for it to uh, do what it intends uh, to do. Uh, personally, I believe that you know we should move beyond this sort of approach of uh, uh, trying to basically focus on these types of uh, criminal bills and instead really uh, look at what is happening in the world of work, why is uh, uh, unemployment increasing and how to, what are the policies that are needed to address uh, uh, employment, address working conditions, um, which you know, are, are quite important. Instead, we, uh, if we look at what has happened in the past year uh, with the labor laws, uh, with the labor codes, uh, we're seeing um, basically uh, uh, a uh, a path which uh, uh, which is uh, leading towards less and less uh, rights of uh, uh, workers to you know organize to uh, uh, to do go on strike uh, which is problematic uh, for uh, the ILO. I will leave it there. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prabha. Uh, over to you. Igor, thank you so much. That was just such a rich and elaborate and detailed critique of various provisions of the law. And I think we really appreciate how you've uh, you know, shown us the, the dissonance between the world of work and the realities of work on the ground and you know, the imagination of the law. This is always a challenge for laws, but I think in this particular case, the dissonance is particularly uh, pronounced. Um, so thank you so much uh, for your uh, presentation. And um, I think we've just, uh, Gautam has just left the, the conversation, uh, but you know, clearly uh, left us with uh, much to think about. So we now uh, move on to Binita Pandey, who is with Warwick in uh, Nepal. Binita, over to you. Uh, thank you, Prava. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Uh, yes. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would just like to give uh, a small uh, introduction of OREC. I think many of you know the OREC, uh, Women's Rehabilitation Center. It was established uh, before uh, three decades, 30 years ago. And uh, the um, uh, coincidence is that it was a part of uh, the uh, interaction with the uh, human, tra with the traffic victim by the OREC's founder. And since then, OREC has uh, worked in this sector. And over the time, uh, the uh, view of OREC has been shifted to more uh, right-based approach. And uh, I feel uh, myself lucky that I have been uh, through, the, through this uh, OREC journey, uh, being associated with OREC. Uh, I have been 
uh, working uh, at this sector, uh, going through the labor law, safe migration and trafficking all uh, together in parallel way. Uh, we are looking these three things differently and sometime uh, together also. And uh, today my presentation is uh, basically based on our Oryx approach, or mostly uh, the feminist approach and the right-based approach. And uh, I have attempted to see this uh, anti-human trafficking uh, draft bill of India. And uh, we are viewing it uh, from the labor migration uh, in Nepal, which uh, where um, lots of uh, thousands and millions of uh, migrant workers uh, from Nepal, either they go to India or go to other countries uh, via the route of India. So how it will impact uh, to, the, uh, to those uh, people through this bill, uh, it, uh, it will be discussed. So going through the bill, uh, I, I, I have uh, generally found three areas which I will be talking on uh, this uh, time. Uh, first, uh, going through the bill, yes, it has defined certain things as offenses and determined the penalties. And uh, we would like to see it through the migration, labor migration domain, like uh, how far it is um, the case of trafficking or it has uh, Inter uh, interrupted the migration phenomenon and also uh, since uh, trafficking is the inter-country phenomenon also and even the bill also it has said the cross-border implication so how uh, it will affect uh, to the labor migration from Nepal so I will be discussing on that and second on the perpetrators as uh, this bill has define the crime and it has also said some people are liable for the punishment and one would be the one who is directly related to the punishment however there are some intermediaries uh, who are not directly related uh, to this phenomenon of trafficking but they might be punished and also uh, the uh, adults uh, who are involved in sex work uh, they can be also punished so they had uh, widen the scope of perpetrators and uh, I shall be discussing on it and also uh, lastly about this bill how far is it protecting the rights of the victims and um, uh, what shall uh, be looked after on and about OREC uh, we definitely uh, advocate uh, for the use of word survivor but for the legal and medical reason definitely we use the word victim so I shall be using uh, the word victims uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, now talking about the first thing about the crime or the criminal act, uh, we can see in the bill as um, it has firstly defined what is uh, trafficking in person and in the aggravated form of trafficking in person it has even uh, kept uh, like even the smuggling of migration uh, migrants and it has also referred to other uh, uh, acts. And what I find the interesting thing about the bill is though it's a bill, it has referred lots of name of other bills, other acts are prevalent in India. So it is, it makes uh, really difficult for a normal person to understand the act. I mean, uh, going through one act is just not possible. We have to go through seven, eight more acts to understand the content of this act. Uh, but how we're talking about the labor migration, what uh, it has uh, given is in the aggravated form of trafficking in person, even the uh, labor migration they can be also counted in as the uh, form of uh, trafficking by this uh, new law and it has also said uh, in the uh, 23 while defining the trafficking in person explanation it has said a victim uh, need not be physically moved or be transported uh, from one location to another for determination of offense of trafficking in person so if there is labor migration and um, and we know that india is the transit uh, route for the women migrant uh, to go to other gulf countries um, through um, for especially for those undocumented workers so uh, if they are found in india in that condition it is a uh, more much uh, more likelihood that they would be treated as a trafficking victims and uh, treated accordingly so but however uh, the laws uh, it is everywhere it is understood that the case of smuggling trafficking and migration they are independent of each other though they are related but they are independent of each other and the uh, approach of this bill to kept everything inside one basket is really uh, problematic 
So I, I can say um, about the labor migration of people from uh, Nepal to India, it has been always a kind of welcoming and the easy one for Nepalese uh, to migrate to India and uh, to migrate to other countries through India. But however, uh, through this bill, uh, we can see that it has um, fail to distinguish this phenomenon of migration uh, by uh, by connecting it with the trafficking nexus and uh, ultimately it has resulted that the under it resulted the vulnerability of undocumented uh, workers and uh, if we see the bill in its current uh, form has potential to encompass all the common labor relations such as faulty recruitment poor working condition non-payment of wages and other exploitative uh, work arrangement uh, uh, now are kept under the domain of criminal law and also these uh, cases can be taken to the cross-border implication that means even it affect uh, to the Nepali um, Nepali people and they can uh, intervene uh, using this law however uh, these cases are uh, are most likely to be dealt through labor law or uh, criminal or other um, migration related laws in Nepal. So uh, there is, uh, so it has created some more confusion in this uh, process. Now talking about the perpetrators, now from the act uh, to the perpetrators, we can see there is blanket criminalization. I mean, uh, there is no uh, such exception or no such consideration like it has said perpetrators uh, uh, as uh, I mean like in the terms of while defining exploitation it has says who himself may or may not be the perpetrator of such exploitation that means uh, it has though uh, the perpetrators uh, can have various, uh, various degrees but however everyone is criminalized and we can see um, um, uh, there is a provision in 32 like a punishment for intentionally omitting uh, to verify identity and travel document of person to uh, enter destination country. So it is uh, definitely uh, giving signal to the intermediary or the agents. And you can find uh, in terms of Nepal, it is very common that uh, unlike other countries like Bangladesh, where there is more institutionalized agent but in case of uh, nepal those who migrate to india they go through very local intermediaries who operate locally and informally and uh, now uh, these people are um, put under this uh, people are intervened through this act and for them also uh, this criminal punitive system is applied so uh, it has increased that uh, this sort of uh, labor recruitment would now uh, go underground and uh, ultimately it will again uh, create uh, more um, risks uh, to the workers at the end uh, so uh, what we have so what we can say is this uh, complex issue of labor migration and re uh, recruitment uh, need to be reimagined from a surveillance and securitization system from this bill uh, to adopting a right based approach and now lastly talking about the victims uh, prevention cure and rehabilitation as supposed by the bill itself uh, i have just jotted down some of the points which i found really um, important uh, for the uh, migrant workers especially from uh, nepal and uh, from the preamble, uh, we can see it seems quite positive, like it says to provide care, protection, rehabilitation to the victim while respecting their rights and creating supportive uh, legal, economic and social environment for them. And particularly, we can see in preamble, it has says uh, respecting the women and children rights now, but uh, from uh, but while going through this bill, you, you can see, we can see the words of his, uh, mainly his, him, so most, mostly they have referred to the main uh, i mean we should also somehow uh, go if we go through the language of the act itself also it is not quite uh, inclusive in nature as uh, it has used mostly uh, male pronunciation at many parts uh, that was just uh, uh, additional content which i, I could see uh, and uh, about uh, this act, uh, it has uh, said that the consent of victim is uh, irrelevant. Uh, wherever, uh, in terms of migration or labor migration, we talk lots of about the importance of consent. But however, in this uh, bill, it has said uh, it is irrelevant and immaterial uh, if it is related to 23B. And in 23B, it has given a list of uh, conditions. 
And but however, if we see through the migrant workers also, uh, some of these conditions uh, like um, uh, like a use of fraud or uh, deception uh, can be seen in case of uh, migration also when in use of the undocumented workers also now uh, if uh, this is taken for the undocumented workers also then there is chances that they are their cases would be now uh, driving towards more towards the um, uh, trafficking uh, trafficking aspects and the other thing which uh, i'm more concerned about the repatriation as in intercountry uh, trafficking repatriation of the nepalese national uh, to nepal uh, this uh, bill has however uh, differentiated between the city its own citizen and other national if we go uh, deeper like uh, in during the repatriation uh, for um, for other people like for example for nepali to the nepal it has said that it will ensure the legal aid and assistance and legal representation but however for its citizen it has said it will even give the financial assistance so we can see uh, this view of legal aid and assistance is that once the victim they will identify themselves uh, they have uh, automatically they have to uh, support the prosecution or for the law enforcement agencies it somehow implies uh, that intention of the bill and rather than uh, giving them more protection or more support uh, like financial assistance and other things uh, this bill has uh, seemed to be purposefully omitted uh, these things in cause uh, in case of other nationals and lastly about the uh, informed consent also uh, informed consent in uh, repatriation it has said that within india uh, all the cases uh, every repatriation within india sh uh, shall be the subject to informed consent of the victim taken after adequate psycho counseling if and as required then what about uh, outside the india so definitely it has created its own citizen and other people uh, who are uh, the victims of trafficking uh, differently so on analyzing it from the welfare versus uh, right based approach uh, I, I we can see that there is the case of informed consent which uh, this bill has um, violated and also the concept of due diligence um, both nepal and india we are the signatories to the cedar convention where it uh, applies to the principle of due diligence but if and when required uh, those uh, phrases has definitely violated uh, this principle and about the informed consent definitely uh, it has no, uh, it has distinguished its uh, citizen versus other nationals and um, in case of the migration for labor and it has been found the identification of the victim migrant workers they don't like uh, themselves to be identified as the trafficked victims but however uh, by uh, applying this bill uh, there is chances that the, their case would be turned over the case of the trafficking one and uh, and uh, though the uh, labor migrants uh, do not identify themselves as trafficking victim there there is likelihood that they would be going through the process of investigation and rehabilitation and we know uh, the problem of rehabilitation uh, though it looks good in paper but however in its implementation there are lots of problem in nepal also and in india also uh, there are many things uh, uh, that that is morely more guided by the welfare approach and if we see about the uh, nepalese national then there should be the additional supports like uh, the language the culture the food issues but uh, those are uh, not considered or uh, or are not given due uh, due importance and uh, as already i have already said there is the criminalization of victims like if they do not want to cooperate or they, they do not uh, become the victims then there there is likelihood that they would be punished and in case of repatriation uh, irrespective of consent those labor migrants now once uh, they are under the uh, once they uh, get uh, with the officials they are caught by the official there is likelihood that within six months as the bill has it uh, they would be sent back to nepal but uh, the case of repatriation and reintegration is different definitely reintegration they should be reintegrated into uh, nepal but in case of those labor migrants uh, those who have taken loan now staying into the uh, rehabilitation center at uh, 
India for six months. There is cases of increasing of interest. There is cases of uh, forced return, and they are not um, prepared uh, for reintegration or for going back. And there is chances there of the circular migration, or the cases will be repeated again. So these uh, are the things which I have identified. And for the uh, what I have identified is that during this bill process, uh, if uh, this bill is not benefiting uh, the victims or, or, or the vulnerable population, then who is it protecting to? I mean, this bill, uh, by using the uh, concept of trafficking, actually is limiting the mobility of the women uh, and uh, is uh, just reiterating the certain principles of patriarchal values, again, uh, through law. And the other thing is um, we should also consider about the self-determination of uh, people, everyone is sovereign, uh, to decide on their matters in case of the adults. Like um, this bill has uh, failed uh, to ensure the right to migration of women while protecting them from exploitation and trafficking. And also this bill could not identify whether uh, there is difference between forced and voluntary prostitution because not all sex workers are the victims of trafficking. And uh, this blanket approach is fallacious. Uh, so while concluding, uh, I just like to say is that in case of labor migration and trafficking, there are various uh, legal domains like labor law and criminal law domain uh, uh, with the help of, and in criminal law, we can see there are transnational organized crime national criminal legislation, regional instruments are there. And there is also international human rights law, which uh, had openly advocated for the migrant workers' right. However, in case of this bill, uh, it has, we can see the criminal law has uh, over emphasize and it has covered up all other parts of labor law and international human rights law. So this has to be uh, seriously reviewed. And uh, uh, while concluding, what I can see is that through this trafficking in person bill, firstly, there is the serious problem on identification of victim of trafficking in person. Uh, and why this is because uh, the consent of victim is disregarded throughout the process and the act is more guided by welfare approach rather than right based approach and ultimately uh, these policies are focused on deterring women's right to mobility and uh, movement and has uh, criminalized the vulnerable population. So uh, I'd like to end here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Vinita. That was just so fascinating and such an important uh, missing piece of the conversation because I think we've also tended to be quite national in the way we talk about you know law within the jurisdiction but this question of mobility which is happening all the time between Nepal and India and what the implications of the bill on that mobility I think is, is a very useful piece uh, for us to really grapple with and also where you ended up was really beautiful talking about how the various legal domains intersect and which domain is now dominant uh, you know, uh, uh, is, is really a great way of looking at it. I think, and it also takes us very nicely to Tripti's presentation now, uh, where she's going to pick up on the piece around international human rights law. So over to you, Tripti, now. Thank you, Prabha. And um, uh, so the Lawyers Collective has been uh, working with uh, the Durbar Mahila Samanvay Committee and the All India Network of Sex Workers, um, and we've uh, written to the government asking for more time uh, to respond to the bill showing that this, uh, the time uh, period given actually violates their own pre-legislative consultation uh, policy of 2014, as well as possibly breaches some of the government of India business transaction uh, rules. And of course, we've also been independently examining uh, the bill as, as uh, human rights lawyers. Um, I think the, I'd like to just begin with reiterating what uh, you and Bandana and several other speakers have done, that the discourse around trafficking in South Asia has been dominated by sex work or prostitution responses. Of course, uh, the South Convention of 2002 was partly responsible, but also just the narrative uh, over the uh, 80s and 90s, which was fueled by images of women and girls from Nepal and Bangladesh being found in brothels in uh, Indian cities. And this is what also captured the imagination of litigants 
uh, you know, typically the public interest litigation, uh, which was uh, presented before various courts, which kind of again uh, strengthened the association or the nexus between trafficking uh, and sex work. And I think, uh, you know, when the government was uh, trying to amend the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act, India's anti-sex work law in 2005, 2006, some of us, including the, uh, us at Lawyers Collective, thought that one way to diffuse the singular or disproportionate attention given to sex work in anti-trafficking law is by saying, well, you need to expand the ambit of anti-trafficking response and anti-trafficking laws and policies, and also focus on other areas like forced labor, et cetera. And now I think in hindsight, we realize that this is something which has obviously backfired because uh, while the attention to sex work is very much intact, now we have all of these other areas uh, involving labor and migration and other forms of uh, precarious work also being subjected to this excessively punitive um, response. Uh, and yet, I think the movers and shakers behind uh, the bill as also in terms of opposition to the bill are pretty much people who are have a position on sex work. And uh, uh, I think people who are supporting the bill, uh, both directly and behind the scenes, have an abolitionist position on sex work. And those who are in the front line of uh, resistance are also sex workers and their allies. And while uh, there have been attempts to broad base the critique and uh, you know uh, get other people on board, but I can you know confidently say that if sex workers were not raising their voice, there would perhaps be little or no opposition to the trafficking uh, legislation. And as Prabha, you rightly said, that given the wide ambit of this bill, which uh, doesn't leave anyone untouched, I think we have a lot of we owe a lot of gratitude to sex workers for taking on this very very difficult fight and doing all that they can to prevent this horrendous bill from becoming law. I think history will really prove sex workers' rights and really owe a huge debt of gratitude to them for raising the banner of resistance um, to this law. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that I think somewhere also acknowledge that it is thanks to all of our efforts, all of us who are uh, you know, on this call today, all our work over the last two decades or so, that the trafficking bill, uh, present bill of 2021, in its uh, objectives or preamble, says that while the bill is intended to prevent and control trafficking, prosecute offenders and support victims, it will do so by respecting their rights. And I think these words were not there, they were missing in the 2018 version of the bill, uh, or for that matter, any other previous attempt at legislating on trafficking. And but to me, they are an unmistakable admission on the part of the state that up until now, anti-trafficking measures have been unmindful of uh, human rights, have not taken into account the rights of victims or other persons and have mostly hurt rather than helped. So while there's much to rejoice in this admission, I I think the problem really is, as we all know, that the admission really stops, starts and stops at the preamble itself and is not reflected or imbibed in the body of uh, the law. Of course, there are feeble attempts to say that consent uh, is required for medical examination of the victim or that the victim will be treated with dignity and respect for their rights that repatriation from one state to another will be with the informed consent obtained after uh, providing counseling. But the place where, the fundamental place where consent matters most, and which is something that we have all been flagging throughout, which is the forced rescue and uh, involuntary detention in rehabilitation homes, or what, what we, we would call protective detention, uh, which is 
clearly alien to the Constitution of India, consent has clearly been given a go by. So uh, clause 11 one, I think, authorizes a junior level police officer, much junior than the existing rank in the ITPA, to remove a person on the basis of mere reason to believe that such person, that it is necessary to rescue uh, such person without undue delay. Now, absolutely no safeguards have been provided, safeguards that exist in other laws, those which are equally draconian, such as the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act. Even those provide safeguards, such as uh, the reasons have to be recorded in writing, they have to be um, shown, a copy has to be shown to the superior officer, uh, there has to be um, requirements to have witnesses, etc. All of those have been completely ignored. And of course, there's no requirement on the part of the officer to assess uh, the consent and you know, willingness of the person sought to be uh, rescued. Um, I think there is an attempt, a very disingenuous attempt to say that search and seizure provisions of the criminal procedure code shall apply. But frankly, this is you know, subject to interpretation because a, an officer removing a person is not strictly speaking a search and, and seizures. I think you know, it's, they've been very clever about this, uh, but you know, maintaining the facade of uh, protecting um, criminal procedure and rights, but really eroding them at the uh, very base. Of course, further, there is no hearing by the court uh, when such person is uh, presented uh, and they're straight away sent to the protective home. And even curiously, even after an inquiry is uh, conducted and uh, the bill thankfully provides that the person can make an application that they don't want to stay in a home supported by an affidavit, even then the bill just says the court will arrive at a decision. I really fail to understand what is the problem in saying that such a person who is adult and does not want to stay in a home shall be released when this is the most consent is the most significant aspect of the fundamental right to life uh, under article 21 it is now incorporated as autonomy dignity privacy and all the freedoms that uh, come with this and yet this very basic aspect is uh, missing uh, in a piece of legislation that purports to respect uh, rights. And then, of course, there is the clause that uh, Bandana mentioned about consent being made irrelevant um, um, when it comes to uh, trafficking in persons and, and the very problematic laws of abuse of position or vulnerability. So it's quite clear that this notion of respecting rights is, is lip service, it's a farce. And uh, on the contrary, there are numerous instances where uh, rights are being violated in the proposed bill, as, as you know, we've been discussing and we will hear from the second panel also. But, you know, the problem is for those of us who are engaged in advocacy with, say, the media or politicians, for them, the understanding of rights is, oh, but you're getting everything. You see, the victim has so many uh, services, facilities, including compensation, Safety, security, shelter, counseling, skill development, healthcare, etc. So, what you know, what what rights are you really talking about? This this bill uh, is perfectly okay, and here even the OHCHR guidelines on human rights and human trafficking, which I think are more an instrument for prosecution and law enforcement rather than for safeguarding the rights and freedoms. One could just simply look at the bill and mark and say yes we are we are compliant um so i you know i think beneath this of course this facade of protecting rights is a more fundamental question which is that whose rights are we talking about who is a victim who is an offender under this law and the, the greatest uh, worry is the manner in which this bill completely blurs the line between a person the capacity uh, of a victim 
a person in the capacity of an accused or perpetrator, and a simply, you know, basic law abiding person who is, you know, doing everything, everything right and everything lawful according to them, especially in the sphere of uh, employment and informal employment, which, which I will come to in some time. So in a recent speech, uh, the Chief Justice of India spoke about the rule of law. He said we ought to become a country that is governed by the rule of law rather than rule, rule by law. And uh, he observed that one of the first principles of uh, the rule of law is that laws must be clear and accessible and that they should be worded in simple, unambiguous language. And the present bill completely fails on, on this count. It is replete with vague, overbroad, and ambiguous language, which really makes it difficult to understand what are they talking about? What is it that I can do lawfully? And where is it that I am actually violating the law? Where is it that I'm receiving protection? And where is it that I stand on the other side as, as an accused? So just to highlight some examples of uh, arbitrariness, there are just too many to recount, but just a few. So exploitation, as uh, Igor has also noticed, has been defined in clause 27, and that definition is primarily uh, in economic terms. And yet in clause 23, there is an explanation to exploitation, which lists out what could be, uh, you know, what are potential uh, as the areas of uh, exploitation. And the two seem completely unrelated. So if uh, the definition of exploitation talks about uh, taking benefit without due or appropriate consideration, compensation, or return, then what constitutes due or appropriate compensation in the unorganized sector, such as domestic work or sex work, which is not just unorganized, but is also quasi-legal. Each of these involves physical labor. So what, you know, where, and, and does this have to then square up with the, the explanation in exploitation? But remember, exploitation itself is, is a separate offense, apart from trafficking, I think that's clause 35. Um, similarly, uh, the definition of trafficking, you know, talking about recruitment, transport, transfer, harboring, receiving, all of these have an intrinsic element of movement or mobility. Similarly, other parts of the bill talk about source, transit, destination, again hinting that there has to be some element of movement involved. And yet in one of the explanations to, section, uh, to clause 23, it says, doesn't matter, movement is not necessary. So if I could just be sitting at home and perhaps being subjected to trafficking, one really wonders uh, you know, what the real intent is. Take another example, which is uh, that the same activity, such as exploitation of the prostitution of others, constitutes both simple trafficking in persons under clause 23, as well as aggravated trafficking um, uh, in clause 25. Um, several other, including uh, you know, exploitation for uh, illegal uh, for illegal trials, clinical trials, and biomedical research, both, you know, many of these things are overlapping. So the one really doesn't know, will it be simple trafficking and punishable with seven years or more, or will the punishment start at 10? Uh, yet another example, the clause premises uh, uh, has been defined very widely and includes a building, a place, even conveyance, where uh, uh, including those which may be used as source, transit, or a destination of trafficking, which may be used for commission of an offense. And authorities have the power to evict people and close down premises uh, which have been used for the offense without perhaps you know, no investigation, no trial, not even really um, a first information report. So what does this mean in, in, say, the context of domestic work? Are we going to close down homes, private residences? What happens to the residents of the home? What happens to our elderly, to our children? Who are living in their home? Are they to be on the streets? What happens with thanks to uh, Gotham, where he spoke, brought in the Indian railways? Because the definition of premises also includes conveyance. 
And we know that railway, perhaps people move, including for trafficking in, you know, coaches run by the Indian railway. So are, they, are we going to seal those coaches? Are we going to stop our trains? I mean, the absurdity of this is really, really um, shocking. But I really find that uh, it is quite ironic that on the one hand, our courts today are questioning pre-constitutional laws like sedition for being vague and for being overbroad and being liable to abuse and not uh, withstanding the test of the constitution. And on the other, parliament is enacting without any debate or discussion such vague, overbroad and draconian laws like the trafficking bill which in my opinion tend to criminalize in the most stringent terms, even the most innocent and innocuous of everyday behaviors as either trafficking or exploitation. Uh, coupled with the, the weak definitions, I think we've all, some of, uh, some of us have uh, pointed out the excessive and unaccounted uh, powers according to the executive and the law enforcement agencies, including reversal of burden of proof. So it is for me to prove that I was not involved in trafficking, that denial of anticipatory bail, uh, you know, not being granted bail until the court is convinced that you are not guilty and, and of course disproportionate uh, punishments uh, as a result of which swaths of poor people were simply trying to earn a living as both Gotham and Gore pointed out uh, will be thrown into prison uh, accused of a range of offenses uh, possible under this law and interestingly there's been no there is no study or research to support such excessive powers and excessive punishment uh, the little uh, analysis available from data in the National Crime Records Bureau, in fact, shows that over the last three years, there's been a reduction in the number of human trafficking cases. So there's at least, I think, sorry, my maths is a bit weak, but I thought that the reduction is to the extent of 20% from the year 2017 to 2019 which, if anything, shows that the deterrent effect of the law seems to be working. So if the existing punishments under Section 370, 370A, if that framework is resulting in reduction in the number of human trafficking cases in the country, what on earth justifies the sudden need to bring in a whole a lot of, um, you know, um, draconian uh, measures and penalties? Also, interestingly, NCRB data shows that there's a very high rate of charge sheeting uh, in cases involving human trafficking to the extent of 83.7%. So the police really is, is seems to be doing its job and investigating and uh, putting up these cases for trial. But the rate of conviction is uh, a mere 20 Two percent, and I think the rate of conviction for uh, murder seems to be um, in, in the forties. Uh, so this then again leads us to the question, and it is common knowledge that laws which have vaguely defined offences, where it is difficult for even the court to understand or the prosecutor to understand what really is the offence. Those are the ones which lead to high uh, acquittal rates, as, as we are seeing in uh, laws like the anti-terror laws and so many others. So if anything, the existing data shows the need to tighten up the definition, tighten up our understanding of what exactly is human trafficking and work around that, rather than opening it up to get more vagueness and ambiguity. Another, Point I want to just bring out, and there'll be others I'm sure who will comment on this, is that in India, despite the trafficking uh, Palamo protocol talking about children uh, being victims of trafficking, irrespective of whether the uh, means are used, the NCRB data shows that in India, some children have also been accused of committing human trafficking. I would leave that to child rights experts to comment on how, how on earth this is possible. If the child is incapable of consenting, how is the child then capable of partaking in the uh, uh, you know, criminality of the act of human trafficking? So, um, you know, 
another another important uh, dimension I wanted to bring out was that while uh, laws which are now sought to be provisions that are sought to be imported now into the trafficking bill, such as the restrictive provisions on bail, uh, presumption, etc., we are not now talking about in the context of how those are being used to um, target political dissent and you know unfairly jail human rights defenders. Let's not forget the origin of these clauses is not really the UAPA or the anti-terror laws. The origin is in the narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances law, the drug law, which ironically was formulated on the basis of international conventions, particularly the 1988 Convention on Illicit Trafficking. And they were justified back then as an extraordinary response to an extraordinary problem. And I think this is where the danger really lies, that this too will just pass off as something that the international framework requires us to do. And the real worry is that this will now become the blueprint for the new Indian Penal Code and the new Criminal Procedure Code, which uh, are in the making by the Home Ministry. So I really hope the UN uh, and the rapporteurs will take note of this and comment on this, not just from the limited perspective of trafficking, but broader implications on human rights. And the last point I want to make is the worry that given that there are proceedings pending in the Supreme Court in the Buddha, Buddha Dev uh, case, where one of the things that the government was uh, required to do is to have a legislative framework on trafficking, I really worry that this bill will simply be presented as what the government has done and will be given the imprimatur of the Supreme Court really warning of possibilities of a future challenge. So uh, yes, I leave you on, on a very worrisome note, but thank you Prabha, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Smriti. That's, that is indeed a very worrying note to, to end on. Um, uh, I was actually thinking that, you know, it, it, this raises so many constitutional challenges, the bill, that in fact, it would be tied up in litigation for years to come, which actually undermines the interests of victims of trafficking, who ultimately this is meant to, uh, whose needs it's meant to address. But I think you've already told us that that's also uh, would be curtailed if this were signed off on by the Supreme Court. So uh, we, are, we, are, we are sort of out of time for the panel, but I think just given the richness of the interventions, I didn't feel like uh, we should um, uh, cut you off. But I think we do have, you know, this goes into our break time. So feel free to, uh, you know, get a cup of tea or take a short break. Uh, we will, I think, continue. So I think there, there are, um, I mean, if there are any questions that people have or comments or, or reflections, you know, now would be the time to uh, post it. Uh, we have only one question in the Q&A right now, which is a request for translation, uh, which we are uh, unable to address um, right away. But um, if there are other questions for any of the speakers, uh, please do raise your hand or put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, okay, so Vibhuti has a question um, about whether you can say more about why the IPC provisions of 370 have been overridden. So I think this is a question for, for lawyers to, to, to speak about. Well, if I imagine, if I just me, I think uh, Vibhuti, they are, because they're not bringing in a, a new definition of trafficking in clause 23, um, uh, Section 370, which again defines uh, trafficking, will have no meaning. And uh, some of the elements of 370 are being brought in, but it is, as, as everyone pointed out, it's much wider. So it doesn't make sense to uh, keep uh, 370 uh, on, on the books. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit about 370. Actually, you know, I've looked at appellate cases filed under decisions under Section 370 and 370A over the past uh, you know, I guess seven or eight years. And what is quite remarkable is that the, those sections have been used for a very broad range of, uh, you know, offenses of trafficking. So it continues to be that sex work is the most targeted. It's used in conjunction with the ITPA the most, 
but you do see cases of bonded labor coming up. You see cases of people migrating to Malaysia for factory work. Uh, you find children who are being trafficked. Uh, so, you know, it's actually, so the aspiration of section 370 to be a secular law, by which I mean not just targeted at sex work, has more or less, you know, come true. But one of the more disturbing issues with a broad definition, even the definition within 370, which does not include, you know, abuse of power or abuse of position of vulnerability, which are the kind of uh, very broad terms for which there's no legal understanding you know, across the world, really. Um, what we find is that Section 370 is often used as a proxy for wrongful confinement. So it's overused by prosecutors for wrongful confinement. So you'll find you know, women who are eloping with their lovers are charged under Section 370. You see 370 used in cases of rape, for example. You know? So 370 is simply slapped on. So I think there is a lot to be said here about, how, I mean, so in a sense, the, the case law under Section 370 is a precursor to how the Section 23 will be operationalized, which is that actually it's very clear that the police and the prosecutors really don't have an understanding of how to use the Palermo definition in the Indian context. And there are very vast number of scenarios in which 370 slap. And in this case, because the punishments are much higher than even the 2018 law, and because there's a blurring of lines between trafficking and aggravated trafficking, and then aggravated trafficking and then higher sentencing based on certain vulnerabilities or situational vulnerabilities, uh, personal vulnerabilities, I think it, it really raises the stakes of you know, what could be happened, uh, what could happen if it were um, you know, operationalized. Um, and Section 370A also, there's a story there about how it's been used against customers of, of sex workers, although high courts are you know, divided on that question uh, of how to use 370A. But there is a question here also, why is, if 370 and 370A are being deleted, why is the ITPA not being repealed? Because in effect, if this is transporting so many of the provisions targeted at sex work, uh, you know, like the provisions on premises, for example, are completely a copy and paste job from the ITPA. So I think there is a larger question here about, you know, how all these criminal laws really relate to each other. But anyway, um, I think there might be, um, oh, okay, here's another question. So Lachna has a question about why begging is still existing as an aggravated crime. Won't this affect the hijra community? Well, I mean, does anyone want to, has, do any of the lawyers have a view on that? I think uh, as, as I see it, it, what they have talked about is uh, engaging in forced or coerced uh, begging. So maybe the the campaign from last time <laughs> had a slight effect and they've qualified uh, begging with post or uh, coerced begging. But of course, the question still is that how is this seen within the transgender community and how easy it is to accuse um, people of uh, forcing someone to uh, engage in begging, even though it may uh, have elements of voluntariness or uh, There's one more question about um, from Varalini. Uh, since the issues of trafficking and migration are transnational in nature, so what about regional cooperation in the South Asian region? Any insights on the BIMSTEC Convention on Transnational Organized Crime? I don't know. Do do Bandana or Vinita or Igor want to speak to the the South Asian context? Uh, I can say something. I don't know about this particular uh, convention that uh, she has mentioned, but what I see, uh, particularly, you know, linking to what Vinita was saying, it's really going to have negative impact on, let's say, the non-existing good relationship within the region. So the relationship among states in the region is in a very bad way, and I would put the um, you know, sort of, you know, the responsibility more on India's thing, because the way India operates within South Asia has never been very good. And uh, so 
Uh, so there are many intersecting issues and it is definitely going to have a negative impact on the relationship. And the SARC uh, has not really delivered on many uh, um, uh, sort of uh, grounds. Uh, so um, uh, for example, like, okay, just going back to what Vinita was talking about, you know, if you look at the, these two countries in uh, Bangladesh and Nepal, um, so we have an open border with Nepal. So not only do Nepali workers come to India, many Indian workers actually work in Nepal. And particularly along the border, a lot of low wage workers from India cross over and work. Uh, and many middle level workers are in uh, sort of Kathmandu and other sort of cities of uh, state. Uh, so uh, the, on the other hand, the border between Bangladesh and India is highly militarized always. And uh, so, so it's really interesting how it would play out. And the, uh, the whole trafficking discourse has actually been quite, uh, quite problematic, uh, uh, even on the um, open border thing. Because while people can come and go between uh, India and Nepal, when, if they're identified as trafficked, like if the Nepali citizens are identified as trafficked in India, they immediately fall under this whole, you know, like the rescue, then repatriation and all that. They don't, so, so it's actually, you know, people who, people would like to stay away from the whole trafficking thing. If they can sort out their uh, problems, they wouldn't go uh, anywhere unless they're in such a uh, vulnerable situation that they have no other option. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I would be actually very worried and, and particularly, I don't know, I mean, people like Tripti would uh, probably be better placed to uh, uh, comment on uh, this thing. Is there a kind of link between, uh, or what kind of implication do we see uh, with regard to the citizenship law and the whole this thing? Because I think that will have an impact on the Bangladesh uh, thing because the citizenship uh, thing is very clearly an anti-Muslim uh, sort of thing. And then I think the linkage with that, I don't know. I mean, uh, it needs a little more thinking and a little more exploration, but I am uh, worried. And, uh, and particularly the way NIA is working and the way many other institutions have been completely dismantled. It's a very uh, worrying piece of uh, legislation. But yeah, if anybody has anything specific about that BIMSTEC uh, convention, I don't know it at all. Vinita, did you have uh, something to add? We can't hear you. Now? Yeah. Uh, actually, I also have no idea of BIMSTEC uh, that um, legislation. Uh, I have so far gone through the SARC convention on trafficking, uh, but regarding the Bandanadi concern about the citizenship issue, I mean, this bill um, has uh, put on one more vulnerability in Nepali side, as it has said that it will repatriate uh, the women along with their dependents. So in case of Nepal, we have huge problem in giving the citizenship to the children in the name of mother. And one would be this reason that many people, they a protest on giving the name of mother saying that they will bring the children from the India uh, from nowhere. Uh, I mean, without father. So it will also uh, aggra uh, aggravate the situation like uh, forceful repatriation, you know, like they just leave uh, them to the border of Nepal. Now, what will be the condition of those women and their dependent children? So there are many more repercussions or the continuum of harm uh, we need to discuss. And I, I just want to say that since it is a cross-border implication issue, uh, uh, Indian government shall also uh, provide uh, this law and have uh, put on discussion with the Nepali government too. However, we do not find it and very few people are aware about this bill. So we think um, a lot of work has to be done, yeah. That's all. That's great, thank you. Igor, did you want to add anything on the regional question? No, oh, just to basically, I, I think uh, in lawmaking, particularly in trafficking, it's very important to 
indeed uh, seek uh, the views uh, and collaborate with the neighbors. Um, uh, now, of course, uh, uh, we are aware of uh, uh, bilateral discussions between some of the countries on trafficking, um, uh, which uh, you know is, is important. Uh, but the, the the way this bill has been introduced is um, is different, and in a certain way, uh, it's very important that the views of uh, of the neighboring countries and how their law is compatible or not with uh, uh, with uh, India's proposed uh, bill uh, would be very important to make sure it is effective. And if if it's just a unilateral um, initiative, then uh, uh, its effectiveness will be put in question. And in the one, one then wonders what, what is the purpose of the law um, other than to uh, give a lot of power to, uh, uh, to the uh, law enforcement uh, and this investigative authority, which is under the law. Thank you so much, Igor. Um, uh, I think there are some questions around this idea uh, of emergence. Uh, we did look very carefully at it to understand what, where exactly this came from. But I think there's a question both from Vibhuti as well as from, um, from Anand Kumar Asna asking about whether this translates into you know, a differentiation in legal treatment. You know, would somebody who's rescued be treated differently from someone who's been, uh, who emerges uh, from being a victim of trafficking. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I can just say that from a very close reading of the, the bill, I couldn't find what the difference was. And it's actually perplexing considering that civil society has played such a dramatic role in actually raid and rescue, that there's only two categories, either you're rescued by the state or you simply emerge. Uh, but I'm sure you know if there are other thoughts on this uh, and, or if you've encountered this in other jurisdictions, uh, it would be very interesting to, to hear about. If I may just uh, uh, supplement, uh, I think they, they were, the existing ITPA does allow a, a so to say victim who is involved in uh, prostitution to approach the, the magistrate and ask for being uh, released and being supported. So there is this distinction between the police going and removing you and then uh, you yourself uh, approaching the authority, the court um, to be more precise, to uh, kind of come out from that situation of uh, exploitation and prostitution. So perhaps this is their way of now giving it um, a kind of uh, definite uh, legal meaning but I must admit that the choice of emergence is rather, rather inelegant and unsophisticated. There could have been better ways of uh, describing this uh, position uh, in, in the bill. But uh, this is, uh, this to me is uh, really just them trying to say that people can come out uh, or want to sort of come out from exploitative uh, situations on their own. Thanks, that is, that's very useful. It's really useful. Any other thoughts uh, or comments? Prabhat, there's a question of NIA. Shimanti's yeah, which, uh, yeah, which Bandana touched on, but feel free to address it in more depth, sure. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the NIA is, uh, though, you know, some people have been criticizing, saying that the, the worst thing for this bill to do is bring in the NIA to investigate. Actually, the NIA was uh, mandated to investigate human trafficking cases back in 2019 by way of an amendment to the National Investigation Authority Act 2008. This is an amendment carried out in July 2019, uh, where the schedule of offenses where the NIA has the power to investigate uh, in accordance with, of course, the, uh, the, the NIA Act uh, was modified to include Section 370 and 378. So even at present, even as we speak, the NIA does have the authority to investigate human trafficking cases. Um, the ITPA is not included. It is only 370, 370A that they investigate. So for the government now that 
370 and 370 is sought to be deleted, it is perhaps uh, natural to fall back on the National Investigation uh, Agency to take over um, human trafficking cases. I think the worrisome part, uh, of course, not so much the investigation, the more worrisome part is that they've also been made responsible for ensuring successful rehabilitation. And this is really uh, quite perplexing. And given that uh, the NIA's track record in uh, investigation and successfully prosecuting uh, uh, cases is so bad, I'm not sure how on earth they're going to show any uh, successful rehabilitation given uh, that they're, they're an out and out um, uh, investigation uh, agency. The other issue is, I think uh, some people have raised that this is kind of, this violates the federal um, uh, structure under the Indian constitution and the seventh schedule, which divides uh, legislative uh, powers between the center and the state. I think this is also not quite straightforward uh, because remember, Trafficking is prohibited under Article 23 of the Constitution. And uh, I think it's Article, one of the Articles 30, something 33 or 34, which says that any, any law that is uh, uh, violating fundamental rights has to be passed by the center, by the parliament, and not the state assembly. So clearly, parliament has the mandate to legislate on human trafficking. Secondly, since we have the Palermo Protocol, the International Convention, we can fall back on Article 253 also to say that we have, you know, we are kind of mandated to take care of uh, trafficking in persons. As far as powers to investigate are concerned, I think this, this is then again in that gray area of Will this be ordinary considered as ordinary law and order, which should be with the with the state uh, authorities, the state government and the state legislature? Or is this of a special nature on account of it being relatable to Article 23 and the prohibition on traffic as also uh, uh, international conventions? And that's why they've tried to balance it out by saying while the NIA can investigate if it is uh, of interstate nature or if the central government wants it to, the states still have the power. And primarily it will be the state police who will uh, enforce uh, this law. And this sort of balance we also see in the NDPS law, the narcotics drugs, where it is both the central um, investigation agencies as well as the state police who um, um, you know, uh, implement the law and enforce it. Great, thank you. So I think we will now take a very short break for about seven minutes um, before we come back to the second panel. Uh, so uh, do, you know, we are going to stop recording now and we'll start recording the second session soon. Uh, but thank you all very much for, you know, speaking at the first panel. Our speakers have been spectacular. I think, you know, really uh, throwing up such a range of questions to think about, uh, you know, a law. And I wish every law had this kind of insight from experts in, from different countries and regions and um, areas of expertise. So thank you very, very much. Um, and we will reconvene in about five to seven minutes. Thank you. And the second panel, uh, as you know, will have uh, you know, lawyers again, a combination of lawyers, law academics, um, and uh, members of the community. Thank you. Uh, 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 Bagema, are you there? Bagema? Jain Madidira? 
ಒಂದ್ಸಾರ ಹೇಳ್ತೀರಾ ಆಶ್ರದ ಸಮಿತಿಯಿಂದ ಭಾಗ್ಯಮ್ಮ ಆಯ್ತು ಆಯ್ತಮ್ಮ ಆಯ್ತು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಅಮ್ಮ ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಶುರು ಮಾಡುವಾಗ ಮಾತಾಡಬೇಕು ವೆರಿ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಮಾ ವೆರಿ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಹಲೋ ಹಲೋ ವನಕಂ 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 ನಿಂಗ ತಮಿಳ್ பேசுவீங்களா ನೀಂಗ ಎಂದ ಊರು ಕಾರಂಗ ನಾ ತಮಿಳ್ನಾಡು ತಮಿಳ್ನಾಡು ಆ ತಮಿಳ್ ಅವರೇ ವರದಿ ಮತ್ತವಂಗ ಬಂದಿದ್ದಾಂಗಲ್ಲ ಅಂತ ಪಾಕ್ರೇ ಇನ್ನು ಯಾರು ಬರ್ಲಿಯೆ ಐಶಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸರಸ್ ಜೀಬಾ ಹಾವ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಬೀನ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ಮತ್ತೆ ಹಲೋ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಹಾಯ್ ಹಾಯ್ yeah hi aisha we are uh, i just want to say you that please add jo in the panel list because she is going to be translating my chats uh, my because i'll be speaking in english in hindi okay okay i think uh, sutapa will be typing the translation no, no, later try later try. time yeah so bataiye will be keeping to the type and everything okay i'll be i'll yeah. be warning everyone at 10 minutes uh, um but i'll look out Okay, okay. So I see what Joe has typed. ಶಕ್ತಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ಲಾಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಐ ಕಾಂಟ್ ಸಿ ಡಿ ಎಂ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಅವ್ರ ಭಾರತಿ ಇದೆ ಏನೋ ಆನ್ ಲಾಕ್ ಡೌನ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಬಿನ್ ವೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಡಿ ಎಂ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಸೊ ವಿ ಬಿನ್ ವೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ ಭಾರತಿ ದಿ ಟು ಟು ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಸಮ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಿಕಲ್ इश्यूज ಅಮ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಆಡಿಂಗ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ರಾಯ್ ಇನ್ ಎನಿ ಕೇಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಿ ಎಂ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ So Joe you'll be typing right while Aisha is speaking Okay great mm-hmm. 